Just and true Forever This is who you are Merciful and faithful High priest forever Merciful and faithful You are merciful Hi, <laughs> welcome to the second of five Wednesday nights on Releasing Destiny, and uh, some of you are watching online, and I'm very thankful for that, and we have a few brave souls tonight in person, yay, they're socially distanced, whether they are doing it for health reasons or not. <laughs> Hey, Patrick, would you do me a favor? I just had an idea. What if I put a chair on the stage and just leaned it up against the back of the chair then, and just have it on stage? That, that might work gooder than, than that did. Gooder. Gooder is even better than not good. Anyway, wherever you are, whether you're listening to it right now on Wednesday night or tape delayed, watching it in the future, I'm thankful for you. And I'm thankful for this opportunity and this young lady on the front that you can't see in the film is Rachel and she is the one who opened this door. So I am tipping my imaginary hat here to you. Uh, thank you, Patrick. That's perfect. I don't know if they can read it on the screen or not because it's reflective, but we'll see. Um, I might have Vanna White paraded around, you know, <laughs> up to the camera. Um, I learned something a few years ago when I got some photos. Hey, come on in. When I got some photos put onto a photo CD. And I thought, oh, this is great. This means I'll have these photos, you know, till Jesus comes back. I can sit down on a computer with Jesus and show him these pictures. And then I learned 
I'm getting educated about technical stuff. I'm not a geek. I learned that over time, bits of information on those photo CDs just kind of evaporates away. So that 50 years from now, there will be a chunk of that that's on your CDs you won't read. That's why you need to get it digitally because it doesn't evaporate from the digital. Why am I telling you that? What does it have to do with destiny? Because our brains are like those photo CDs. And there are, if we don't continue to remind ourselves of things that God is speaking to us, they will just start fading away. And we don't realize they're fading away. This is why in the Old Testament, God repeatedly says to the Israelites, these things, these truths you're getting, um, tell them to your kids. Put them on your foreheads. Put them on your doorposts. Tell your children's children. Keep telling it. Because we're so, it's not just that we're prone to forget. We've got an enemy who is committed to our not growing, on our not learning, our not getting revelation, a deeper revelation of who God is, et cetera, et cetera. That's my excuse for saying, let's do a little review from last week. Because last week really was the foundation for everything else I'm going to say on these other weeks. Thank you, Patrick. That is perfect. Perfect. Uh, And by the way, if this, I'll test your prophetic giftings. If this stain on my sweatshirt made you think, I'll, the word of the Lord to you is, that's probably chicken salad. I just want to confirm that word. That is of the Lord. So, (laughs) so if that bothers you, I'll take it off. But, you know, (laughs) if thy sweatshirt offend thee. (laughs) So, last week, what we talked about is that and this is so important that we started with this, is that whenever you talk about destiny, you got to talk about terms. Now, when I, uh, my degree from school is in political science. You've heard me say I've been a political or politics nut since I was 10. I don't look at one or two or 10 news sites. I look at about 20 to 25. And I'll get different takes on the same thing. And so between them, and I've got, I've trained myself now to when I read a sentence, I'll say, wait a minute, I'll stop on a sentence. Is that fact? Or is that conjecture? Or is that opinion? And when you do that sentence by saying, oh my goodness gracious, you realize how much of what is, quote, news is not. And there are narratives that are tried to be on all sides of the spectrum. So, I know that in politics, you know who, the, who are the ones who really have the power? The ones who define the terms. And if you want to change something, if you want to, you know, change a whole culture, you redefine the terms. Like family. The word family, what does it mean today as opposed to what did it mean 20 years ago or 20 plus years ago? Uh, there's so many things that when you change the term, and the definition of the term, then you, you're the driver in the culture. You're the one that gets to make the decisions and people will follow you because you're telling them what words mean. Words mean things. This is why it's so important about Bible translation and, you know, going, if, you know, if there's a new translation, I want to know the, the ethos of the, the team that did the translation. What, what was it? So, saying all that to say that the definition of destiny in uh, that many believers have has come from the world and not from the bible because the the world will say oh sister you need to find your destiny well you don't have to find it if you already have it right so your destiny is never ever 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 what you do do. (laughs) thank you star student there she's on the a row and it goes (laughs) Your destiny is never what you do. Now, why do I say that? Because of Romans 8, 29. Papa Don's, one of his favorite verses, one of my favorite verses. It says that we were predestined to be conformed to the likeness of Jesus. When you put pre in in front of something, it means beforehand. So when God thought of us before creation, he thought about decisions for our life. He thought about who our parents would be, our nationality, that we would have a beautiful bald head. You know, he made all these decisions for our lives because he thought of us before creation. And his destiny for us 
was that we would look like Jesus. We were predestined to be, the world says you're predestined to do. The world gets their identity from what they do or don't do. And when you bring that into the church, if you're doing a lot of religious stuff, then you're going to think God's impressed with you. (laughs) Jesus has news for us if we're thinking that way. He says, the son, talking about himself, the son can do nothing by himself. You can do nothing by yourself. In other words, if I can't do anything without God, do do I even need to have to spell this out for you? (laughs) We can't do anything without his enabling, his anointing, and his making it happen. He does it all. The only thing we take credit for is that we were crazy enough to say, you know what, we're a, we're a poor little hungry orphan out there, and somebody's offering me to the adoption papers to be adopted by the king of kings and live in the palace. Well, I ain't stupid. I'm going to take that deal, and it's free. So, your destiny is never about what you do. It's never about what you do. Your destiny is who you're becoming. Now, I'll tell my students, I'll say, look, if you'll imagine you're 80, 90 years old, and your extended family and friends want to have a big party to celebrate your birthday. We, we missed Papa Don's 90th because of COVID, but we, I remember the 80th we had here. And there's a microphone set up in front. And all these people that have known you probably all of their life, they get an opportunity to come up at the mic and talk about you. What things would you like for them to say about you? They really, they really were great craftsmen. They could make really good tables. You know, they could really work on a car. Oh, my goodness, they could bake a cake. Is that what you want to hear? All the things you could do? Or do you want to hear them say, they had a heart that looked like Jesus. They loved people. Whenever I was around them, I knew that I was number one in their attention. So if you can imagine that... Some of us are closer to that happening date-wise. If you can imagine what you would like said about you as a person, if you can imagine it now, then what you do is you start making decisions now that will lead to that. I mean, I've never walked from here to Rome, Italy. Well, of course, I got water in between. Let's say Rome, Georgia. Okay, (laughs) I'm from Georgia. I've never walked from Nashville to Rome, Georgia. But if I wanted to, I know the first thing I need to do is turn and face Rome and take steps toward that direction. And it might take me weeks to get there. But I know there's always a first step and there's a turning that has to happen. So your destiny is about who you're becoming. Your destiny is to look like Jesus. And Jesus says, and whatever you do, I would so love to hear the tone of voice when Jesus would speak these things. Because we all the movies, you know, you got, you know, somebody that's supposed to be like right out of central casting. And the Bible, that's not what the Bible says. The Bible says he was basically almost ugly. Oh, would they ever cast someone almost ugly for Jesus? Oh, no, no, no. Because the world gets their identity from how they look also. You can tell people's reflections of what they think of Jesus by how they portray him. Their choice is made. And so, so anyway, we, uh, where was I going to do that? Why, why do I, I, I had a little bit of headache this afternoon. I thought, okay, I'm not going to do this forget what I'm saying thing like I did last week. <laughs> Yes, thank you. I love to read the things in the Bible out loud. I had a speaker one time say this, and it just transformed it. He, me, he said, when you read the Bible, don't just read it silently. And Okay, close your Bible. Okay, I've done my, my duty check. He says, no, if you'll read it out loud and not just read it try, like you're trying to put yourself to sleep. 
You know, if you want, if you have trouble sleeping, you're an insomniac, I, I, I have great news for you. Go to a funeral, go to the burial, and record the pastor reading Psalm 23. And if you have trouble sleeping, it's guaranteed it'll put you to sleep. To me, that's a war psalm. It's all in how you read it. It's all in tone of voice. It's kind of like in, in uh, social media. One thing that is done for us, it has robbed our inability, our, has given us a lessened ability to communicate and relate to each other because we're so used to do it virtually. And when you read Facebook posts or Instagram or whatever your flavor of the month social network is, there's a new one all the time, you can't get nuances of tone of voice. You can't get inflections in the face. You can't get the fullness of the communication they're trying to give you, right? So that means I've got to use my imagination when I read the Bible. I want to put myself in the scenes. I want to hear Jesus' voice. Hi, welcome. I want to know what it, what it would have felt like for the hearers of Jesus in those days. And um, let me tell you this. The two great questions that every human needs to know for their life, either consciously or subconsciously, every human who's ever lived asks these two questions about themselves. Who am I? And why am I here? And here's the problem. The world says, answer the second one first. And then answer the first one. Find out what you're supposed to do and somehow through that get your identity. That's how the world does it. Notice in Matthew 16 when Jesus is a uh, famous passage where Jesus is, says, uh, who do men say that the Son of Man is? They say, oh, some say Elijah, some say John the Baptist, some say Jeremiah. Jesus does not say, but who do you say you are? He said, who do you say I am? Why does he do it in that order? Who do you say I am? Because until you get a clear revelation of who God is, an accurate revelation of who God is, to whatever degree that is off the mark, it's inaccurate, your self-concept will be off the mark and inaccurate. I want to see me the way God sees me so that I'll see you the way God sees you. If I accept and don't challenge these misconceptions I have of God, then that means I'm going to be walking around as a lie for myself. I'm not going to let you see what God sees in me. What you're going to see is me operating out of woundedness. And so destiny begins with knowing God. What did Jesus say in John 17? Father, this is eternal life that they know you. True God. So knowing God is lesson one, the very beginning of you grabbing hold of your destiny. The angels are outside with a wheelbarrow, apparently. Okay. So your destiny is never, ever, ever what you do. Instead, it's who you're becoming. And so the enemy, what he's, he's the liar. He's the father of lies, and he has two lies. Only two. I like to simplify things. His two lies are, begin with a lie about God. And if you believe lies about God, like I was just saying, then you'll believe lies about yourself. That's always the order he goes in. And the reason he lies to you and wants you to believe his deception is so that you'll sin. Every sin you or I have ever committed, every single one of them began with believing lies about God and then lies about ourselves. It's good to know that so that you can go back and do CSI and find out what the truth is that you missed. So... Satan lies to you so that you will sin, so that he can steal what from you? What? Destiny. Your destiny, but your, what? Huh? Peace, that, that happens too. What did God give to man over the earth? Authority. 
you have to understand that Satan's modus operandi, his overarching motivation, everything he does is for this purpose. He wants to rob, steal, and kill, and destroy from you because he wants your authority. He lost his in heaven. God's never going to change his mind. Okay, you can come back, Satan. Just don't do that again. Not going to happen. He lost all of his authority. The only other authority that existed was this junior throne that God gave over the earth to man. And Satan knew the principle that I said last week. There's two statements I said. Anyone or anything you give identity to, you have what? Authority over. This is why God had Adam name the animals. Then he says, anyone or anything that you allow to give you identity has authority over you. So if you get your identity from the four boxes of identity, I'll, I'll get to that on the last week. I'm alluding to it every week so that when I ask you on the last week, you won't look at me with deer caught in the headlight eyes. If you, if you don't know, Jackie will be able to tell you. <laughs> She's a great student. <laughs> All right, the four boxes of identity. This is the Romans 12, 2 pattern of the world's thinking. The world says get your identity from what you do or how you look or what you know or what you have. And all of us have been in all four boxes sometimes at the same time. And whenever you live in a box, you judge other people through that lens. And we bring that into our church expression. Our relationship with fellow believers comes from whatever boxes of identity we operate in. Because if you live in a box, then what you're going to try to do is put other people in boxes. You're going to, you're, you're, if you have let the world tell you what your destiny is instead of God, then you, that's what you're going to give to others. Principle in the, in the Garden of Eden, everything reproduces after its own kind. If you've got a miss, you know, a, an off kilter concept of God, your concept of yourself is going to be created by the world and not by God. And so whenever I teach, my prayer is, is always the same. I said, Lord, help me to see them as you see them. And I've learned a little truth that sometimes the people that are the hardest to get along with or the people that are just have this special anointing to get under your skin, um, those are usually the ones that have the most to teach me. In theotherapy, some of us go way back to theotherapy days, they taught us that when someone pushes your buttons, you know, through what they say or do, whatever, and it really pushes your button, and we go, ow, God, look what they're doing. Ow, God, make them stop. And God said, I know, isn't it great? That's me. The issue is not that they're pushing your buttons. The issue is that you have buttons. <laughs> so if you'll notice the people that just, they just, seem to delight in doing that with you pause say Lord don't take them out of my life until I have learned what you want to show me and let me get past their rough exterior Lord let me get let me see what you see and others don't see in them I've had students in DTS that you know the rest of the school discipleship training school in youth with a mission I've had students that you know because of their attitudes, because of their, the way they relate or whatever, nobody wanted to be around them. And it was a challenge for me, but I'm the teacher. I have to be around them. <laughs> and when they get a breakthrough, oh, my goodness, like the, the clouds part, you know, the, the sun comes down, and all of a sudden, God lets a, us in on how he sees them. Because what I'm seeing now was always in them. It was just buried under a bunch of lies. So our goal is to live free of lies ourselves, so that we have an authority to help other people come out from under the lies. Make sense? So 
Satan wants us to sin the three categories of all sins, lust of the eyes, lust of the flesh, and the pride of life. And so his, he's the father of lies. He comes to steal your authority. He wants to kill you body, soul, and spirit. And he wants to destroy the father's kingdom through you. And if you are passively in the kingdom of heaven, then you're actively building the kingdom of darkness. We may not realize it, but we may, we're making disciples naturally by osmosis. We think of just the process, okay, I'm in this school, which is all about discipling. So yes, I'm discipling. We don't realize every day of our life people are watching us. And we are discipling people. We're just not used to using that word for it. I told you before there are five Gospels. Matthew, Mark, Luke, John. And your life. And the one the world reads first. <laughs> it ain't those four. It's your life. And when they read your life, who is the Jesus or the God they read on your pages? Because that's exactly what you're reproducing. You reproduce after your own kind. So my encouragement to you is God has hidden inside you incredible glory. And it's the glory of God to conceal a matter. It's the glory of kings to look for it. I don't want to get to heaven and find out that I had, you know, a couple of thousand rooms full of treasures that I never unlocked. I want to know the greatest journey you can go on is, to, is the journey of finding God in you. The journey of searching out the mysteries. The journey of taking to him all your pain and hurt and say, why does this hurt me? Instead of blaming other people and passing it on and hurting other people the way you were hurt, instead of doing that, you take the pain and say, Lord, why does this hurt me so much? Nine other people, I, I remember a time on an outreach I can't remember exactly what happened in some foreign country and something happened and I was just really ticked off. All my buttons were pushed and none of the other nine people were bothered. I'm like, great. They're just, I'm working with nine blind people. God says, no, no, they're working with one blind person. There's a reason why things bother you that don't bother other people, and it has to do with what's inside you. And if we can learn to quit saying, Lord, look what they're doing to me, and instead say, Lord, why does this hurt so much? Because in that process, you're going to learn more about the accurate picture of God. He's the healer. That he paid the price for the people that hurt you, so you don't need to hold them responsible anymore. You don't need to hold them as still owing something because he doesn't hold you like that. So, and I, I'll just say this one more thing that when man sinned and they, they were naked and they hid, God says, where are you? He's, they said, we're naked and we hid. And then God says this gut-wrenching, heart-wrenching thing. Who told you you were naked? In other words, do you know how utterly important it is to God that we have an accurate picture of how we see ourselves? How much he grieves when we have let the lies of the enemy distort this incredible thing that he made in us. I mentioned before Psalm 139. David says, how wonderful are your works, O God. I know that full well. He wasn't talking about rainbows and waterfalls and tropical fish and peacocks. He wasn't talking about all the fit natural. He says, your works are wonderful. Oh God, I know that full well. I am fearfully and wonderfully made. David, the man after God's own heart, understood he was the apex of God's creation. That God thought of us before creation and everything that he created was for us. As a place where we could walk in authority and in fellowship with him. That was his desire and God would so love for that to have been still the case through history. 
But alas, there was sin in the garden. Now, some people say, well, you know, if I'd been in the garden, I mean, how hard can it be? God says, don't eat fruit. You just don't eat fruit. I have news for you. Guess where we all were when man sinned? In them. We sinned in the garden. Now, some might theologically argue with that, but biologically, we were in them. Do you agree? I tend to believe we all sinned in the garden so that all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Therefore, God needed to send his son. All right. That's kind of enough review. There's a lot more I could say, but it, does anybody have a comment or a question before we move into new stuff? I don't want to leave anybody behind. Anybody at home? If you got a question, send it to Rachel. <laughs> maybe, maybe she can relay it to me. Um, or after tonight, let me know, and I'll be glad to see what I can do to help, help with your question. Yes, sir. Four boxes of identity. What you do, how you look, what you know, and what you have. There are subsets beyond that, but those are the four biggies, I think. Um, all right. Well, when man sinned, there were consequences to the sin. Uh, Phil, uh, Patrick, can you answer? I've got to, I get it on first. Would you answer Cynthia Damon's question for me? Um, there was consequences to the serpent. There was a curse on the serpent that we saw partially fulfilled on the cross. And then we will see the finishing of that sentence later. There was a curse on the woman, pains in childbirth, and her desire would be for her husband. By the way, that doesn't mean, oh, i got to get married. From what I've understood in Hebrew, it, it's like a black widow desire for her husband. You know, a little salt and ketchup, and her husband starts to look good. And then the curse on the land because of the man was that it was not going to be easy to get fruits and vegetables now. It's only going to be by the toil of his brow and the thorns and thistles he's got to work through. So God pronounced these curses on the serpent, the woman, and the man. But then the next thing he did has had the ramifications for every human who's ever lived since. He kicked them out of the garden. And he posted some angels with flaming swords so they couldn't go back in. Right Now, why do I say that so definitively? Getting kicked out of the garden meant separation from God. That was the birth of what we call the orphan spirit. And every human who's ever lived has had the orphan spirit. And just because you got saved, I got news for you, doesn't mean you stop thinking like an orphan. It's that orphan spirit is why Jesus says, I will not leave you as orphans because that's how he found us when he came to earth. The whole earth was one big orphanage with Satan as the cruel orphan master. Did you guys ever watch Little House on the Prairie? And the, the guy that would come sometimes looking to pick up vagrant kids, Claymore, that was the name of the, <laughs> I just think of Claymore when I think of, the whole world was this orphanage. And what's, a different, what's the purest definition of an orphan? Someone without parents. Because we were separated from God, Satan was then able to father us. And the process of being transformed is undoing the parenting of the enemy and allowing the parenting of Abba to transform our lives. Does that make sense? What did I say? <laughs> the, 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 when we have the orphan spirit, the enemy has parented us. So the, the process of transformation is undoing the, par the parenting of the enemy and allowing the parenting of Abba Father to come in and undo all of that stuff. So, 
again, I said, you've got how you know God is the beginning of your destiny. So tonight we're going to look at how does the orphan spirit versus a spirit of sonship or daughtership relate to or look at God. That's tonight. Next week we're going to look at how those two different views, opposing views, look at or relate to themselves. The next week we'll look at how these two opposing views look at or relate to others. And it goes in that order. It flows in that order. All right? So what I'm going to do, I'm going to, uh, I had the wrong color marker. Um, I am going to write one or two words in each column just as a summary word. Um, and I'm going to give you a much longer list for each one of these categories. So I, I did Dave say he can see this? They, they can pick it up online? Okay. O for orphan, orphan spirit. Some people are uncomfortable with hearing the term orphan spirit. So if you would prefer to call it orphan mentality, feel free. The reason I call it orphan spirit, because Romans says we've been given a spirit of sonship. So if there's a spirit of sonship, I assume there's a spirit of orphanhood. You know, could be wrong, but that's my thought. So orphan spirit versus spirit of sons and daughters. I'll fix that in a minute. So tonight we're going to look at this top category, how they look at or relate to God. All right. Now, everybody with me? Anybody lost? Confused? Am I okay? Sorry. Oh, sorry. We'll do this trip thing here. All right. I want you to think for a minute. Oh, I don't have my watch on. I need, uh, let me get my phone so I can keep track of time. <laughs> um, thank you. Um, I want you, all right, maybe you had a life growing up with your biological father. That's probably most of us. Some of you, maybe it was a stepfather. Some, maybe it was a grandparent or grandfather that had to step in for whatever reason. Um, maybe you're like my adopted little brother in Latvia who had grew up with no father his whole life. He lived in an orphanage from one month old. So he, he didn't have any father growing up. So... But even if, even for him, he had figures that trained him what a father was like, whether or not they had a role, direct role in his life. So I want you to think for a minute, who do you most see as shaping your life from a father's standpoint? It could be a grandfather, like I say. All right, and when you think of who that is, I want you to think of five words you would use to describe what their parenting was like for you. I don't want five words like, you know, good athlete, uh, cool dresser. You know, I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about them and you. What are five words you would use to describe if you were to sum up their fathering of you? They can be good words. They can be difficult words. But make them honest words. I'll be surprised if when I go through all the words that I have on the two sides, I don't hit many of the words you've written. Because I love to talk to people about what was their situation growing up. What was it like? I want to learn. Um, by the way, everything I'm talking about these next three weeks, about these things, I was teaching on the orphan spirit in Latvia. And Rainus was on the front row, 19 years old, Latvian. 
He raised his hands. He said, this is my adopted little brother now. He said, Joseph, I've been an orphan all my life. I said, what? He said, I've been an orphan all my life. You never lived in a house? I never had a foster family or anything like that? He says, no. I've never lived in a house in my life. I said, where did you live? He said, I lived in the state-run orphanage until they kicked me out last year when I turned 18. Then my translator, who was the co-leader of the school, Morris, who's 28, he says, oh, Joseph, remember, I've been an orphan since I was eight. I said, whoa, hold the phone. You, you, get up here and teach. I'm sitting down taking notes. I want you to describe for us what it felt like. What was the experience of growing up as an orphan? Because most of us don't have that experience. So you need to paint the picture for us. You're a better teacher on this, far better than me. I want you to describe what did it feel like? What kind of things did you normally deal with? Uh, what were your highs, your lows? Whatever. Tell us. And as they talked, I went down my list. Check, 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 check. The stuff I'm teaching you, God, this was such a gift to me from Abba. They confirmed this. Now, everything in the natural reflects something in the spirit. And everything they said in the natural had spiritual parallels to it. So I prayed with Rainus that afternoon. And, and in the middle of the prayer, the Lord said, why don't you adopt him as your brother? Good idea. So I said, we don't need a court to make it official. I said, I'm sh we'll shake hands on it. We'll hug on it. You are now equal to my flesh and blood brothers back in Georgia. So he's my brother. So, uh, whatever your father figures were like in those formative years of your life, please hear this, that's going to form your concept of God as an adult. Psychologists tell us that 90%, 9-0, 90% of your identity is formed in the first four to five years of your life. 90% of your identity is in the first four to five years of your life. Now, how many of you have lots of memories of your first four to five years of life? You're really weird if you do. You know, I have one at two and one at five, and after that, it's, you know, more later. So that tells you that 90% of what impacted or affected or shaped your self-identity was formed in a time where you don't even have the memories, conscious memories of it. But subconsciously, every second of your life is recorded. And we think that we operate out of our conscious mind. We don't. We all operate out of our subconscious because our, our subconscious is what tells us what we believe to be true. And YWAM, we have this thing called the beliefs tree. You've probably heard it before. It's not a YWAM copyright thing. But the beliefs tree, imagine I drew a big tree. The roots are your beliefs. The trunk of the tree is your values. The branches of your tree is your habits or how you live your life. And the fruit of the tree comes from how you live your life. So if you look at the fruit of someone's life, good or bad, you can do, you know, do a CSI, <laughs> backtrack to what's not seen, what's under the ground, the roots. The root beliefs form your values. Your values will dictate what you do and how you live. And how you live will determine the fruit of your life. So whatever your father figures were like in those first four to five years, they shape not only your identity, but how you see God. Before your identity, it shaped how you see God. So your concept as an adult today was almost entirely formed in the earliest years of your life. Now stick that in your pipe and smoke it, because that is powerful right there. Your concept of God as an adult was formed in the earliest years of your life. This is why Jesus, or God says, train up a child in the way he should go. Because when he's older, he won't depart from it. He knows that, that when your 
earliest years of your life is when the soil of your soul is the most fertile. And whatever seeds are planted in fertile soil are going to grow. Whether they're seeds of the enemy or the seeds of the Lord. And the enemy knows that and he tries so hard. If he can't abort the baby in the womb, then from first breath of life, he's going to do everything he can to rob that life. To steal that life from living for the glory of God. From knowing the love of God. And he's going to be lying about God so he can lie about them. Make sense? So if you look at those five words... Think about how you've seen God. Because I dare say, there's some crossover there. And we're going to go through this list. And, uh, you know, I I will. I think I told you about the church in Brazil that will probably never have me back again. Um, (laughs) About how I went through this list with them. And I said, out of 400 people, I said, now how many of you heard anything on the orphan spirit side that is true for you, that you and God are working with and you're trying to get free from? And me and about 10 people raised their hands. So I thought, well, maybe the translation was off. I've learned when you're in another culture, sometimes translators word it in a way where the meaning doesn't get across. So I said it in a different way, same answer. And I said something you should never say when you're a guest preacher. (laughs) There's a book of things you don't say, and I said it. I said, are you kidding me? Are we going to have to pray about a spirit of lying in this room? I thought, well, they're going to crucify me now. I might as well keep going. So I said, I said, um, I said, what's your greatest dream for this church? Is your greatest dream that every Sunday the whole community comes here? You got to knock the walls out. You got to have four or five services. This is the place to be every Sunday morning. How many of you, that's your greatest dream for this church? I kid you not. 400 people stood up and they're, oh, hallelujah, hallelujah. And I was just grieved. And I felt the grief of the Holy Spirit. I mean, for for five minutes, they're just dancing around. I just waited until they sat down and got perfectly quiet. I said, if that's the biggest dream for your church, I feel incredibly sorry for you. God wants to give you nations as your inheritance, and you're satisfied with warm bodies in a chair two hours on Sunday. By the way, these three YWAMers who attend this church that were a part of the school I was teaching that week, they said to me, I said, so that church helps support you? They said, oh, no. I said, what do you mean? I said, no, no, they've, they don't, they've never given us anything. You're kidding me. I said, yes, I would love to preach at your church. So I said, how many of you wish you had bought a stock in Apple computers 30 years ago we, and still had it? We'd all, you know, you could buy a few cities with it now. So if you want a return on investment, you got to invest on the front end. I said, your, your uh, buddy over here from the church, he's about to leave on an outreach to New Zealand and Samoa in three weeks. How many of you would like an inheritance through your brother in New Zealand and Samoa? And they all raised their hands. I said, great. Everybody get your wallet out. Those hands went down like so fast. I said, why would you put your hands down? Did you mean it when you raised your hands or were you a bunch of religious orphans? Because if you want an inheritance in the nations, you've got to invest in the nations. God says, I'm going to give it to you, but you need to go. And there's only two categories, your goers or senders. There's not a third category. Not many people wanted to talk to me afterwards. I said, look, I said, don't wait on your pastor to call an offering. So that you can, because they do their offerings where each row goes up and gives. And, you know, I said, don't be like the Pharisees, like, Hey, get this on film, you know, YouTube next week. I was in a church in Brazil, in Burundi, Brazil, on, uh, no, not Burundi, Benin, West Africa. It was uh, Pentecost Sunday. And they do that. They do their offerings that way. 
by row, they come up. And from where I was sitting on the stage, I could see every hand that went into the collection plate. Two thirds of them were empty. It's their tradition to act like they're putting money in. So I said to this church in Brazil, I said, um, don't wait for the pastor to call an offering. I said, here's, here's something I know about YWAMers and missionaries. If you just came up and you just slipped money in their pocket and nobody but God saw it, God would see it and would reward you because you're investing in the kingdom not for the glory of man, but for his glory. So after the service, I'm talking to the YWAM buddies and I feel a tug on my pocket right where my wallet is. And I like... I turned and looked, and there's this tall, skinny guy named Gabriel who was a uh, part of the worship team, played bass. Tall, skinny guy. And I said, and I reached in my pocket, and there was a two hay ice, which is kind of like the widow's two mites. It's not worth much. The smallest denomination in their currency. I said, what is this, bro? He says, he says I want you to know I heard you. He says, I'm in school right now, so I can't, I can't be traveling to the nations right now. I don't have a lot of money, but this is what I have. And I know that you go to the nations, so I'd like an inheritance through you. Can I do that? I said, bro, let me pray for you. And I want you to know for the next three or four months, every country I went to, I said, Lord, make sure in heaven, Gabriel gets an inheritance in this nation because of what he did. And I said to Gabriel, I said, if you're the only person out of 400 who got this tonight, it's worth coming here for you. You got it. So Satan does not want us to claim inheritance. Satan wants us to be stuck on stupid. He wants us to be stuck in the lies that he gave us at the earliest part of our life. So I'm going to give you a key word to describe how the orphan spirit sees God. You ready? Boss. Boss. You see, because with the orphan spirit, you get your identity from what you do, so you relate to God as boss. Now, how many of you have ever had a job in your life? Okay. Would you describe your relationship with your boss like this? Every morning you came to work, you were so excited. You went straight to your boss's office and you sat in their lap and you gave him a big hug. Oh, how are you? I thought about you all last night. Tell me everything. What did I miss? Oh, you're my favorite person in the world. How many of you had a relationship like that with your boss? How many of you know that you can work for years for a boss and not know anything about their personal life? You don't know where they live. You don't know how many kids they have. If they vacation, you know, what do they study in school? What their favorite food is. You can, you can connect with a boss for years. But what is the essence of the, the only reason why you want to connect with a boss? Find out what the work is. Because if you don't work, you don't get paid. So when you bring the orphan spirit into your Christian walk, you want to do spiritual stuff so God will have to pay you. He owes you. I don't think so. How many people pray begging God to tell them what to do? If more of your prayer life is begging God to tell you what to do next than begging God to tell you about himself, you pray more like an orphan than a son or daughter. Because the motivation of a son or daughter is to be like their dad. The motivation of the orphan is to work to earn. It's a contractual thing which is not guaranteed, so i got to keep working. So I remember I, I, uh, I, was, I had just finished my discipleship training school in Melbourne, Australia, and outreach in India, Singapore, and Hong Kong. It was awesome. But I came home broke, uh, no job, 
no car, and no idea what to do next. I'm staying on someone's couch. And God sends John Dawson, a future international president of YWAM, to Belmont Church, and he's talking about destiny. And if you saw me in the pew, I always take notes whenever I'm listening to a sermon, you know. Uh, now I do it in my phone. But if you saw me in the outside, I would be like, mm-hmm, mm-hmm, yeah. On the inside, I'm screaming, God, what do you want me to do? Just tell me. I gave up everything. I sold everything and went to YWAM. What do you want me to do? Don't you love when God answers a question with a question? He said, do you know why green and blue are your favorite colors? I mean, he said it like that. Just like, almost like, yeah, you really want to. Background, I'm a Joseph. I've always loved colors. My first word as a baby was flower because my grandparents had this huge organic garden long before it was cool to be organic. Little background. So I said, oh God, why are green? I'm talking destiny. You want to talk colors. Okay, why are green and blue my favorite colors? He says, well, every flower before it blooms is green first, and that's you. You help things bloom into what I created them to be. I'm like, okay, that's pretty cool. What about the blue? He says, the blue is the water that feeds the flowers and causes them to grow, and that's me. So you and I work together in my garden where no two flowers are the same. Different shapes, sizes, colors, and smells. That's who you are. You notice what happened? I was asking him to tell me what to do, but he knew the deeper question that I needed answered first was who I am. I didn't fully understand that until two years later when God called me back to Melbourne, Australia. I'm staffing my first school there, and there was 41 students from 15 nations. They were all leader types, and... I'm looking around the room like, you know, my dad has this frame thing. There they go. I should hasten after them for I am their leader. <laughs> That's how I felt with all these really incredible people. And I'm looking around the room and I heard the Holy Spirit whisper, this is that blue and green thing I was telling you about. That's why YWAM is my tribe. I get to be who I am there and here. This is not what I'm doing teaching you. I'm giving you me. Because I am my message and you are your message. What is the message of your life? And if you don't know, you need to get on your face and you need to ask the Holy Spirit to start shining a light on rooms that you didn't even know existed down in there. Because it is the glory of kings to search for what God has hidden inside you. So if you see God as your boss, and let's say growing up, uh, maybe your parents were in some way abusive. There are a lot of, lot of forms of abuse, and it seems like the, longer, the darker the world gets, there's more expressions of abuse. There is physical abuse, sexual abuse. There is verbal abuse. There is emotional abuse. But a, what they all have in common is taking something from you that there was no right for them to take from you. If in any way you were robbed by your authority figures growing up, you will transfer that identity unto God. You see, with my big spoon, which I'm sorry I didn't get out yet. It was here. It just was resting. With my big spoon, I'll come up to people and I'll, I'll just like... This is what the enemy will do. Oh, I'm getting out of the camera range. Sorry. I'll hit you and go, oh, look what God did to you. It's just what Satan does. Every good and perfect gift comes from the Father of heavenly lights. Every bad thing came from the enemy. The enemy does all the bad stuff and then he blames God for it. And if you're listening to the enemy, you got to know who to and not to listen to. If you're listening to the enemy, then you're going to believe and you're going to, to some degree, you're going to hold God responsible for bad stuff that happened in your life. If your parents were judgmental, that no matter what you did, it wasn't good enough, Never forget, I was in Pichilemu, Chile. 
a place I've taught many times, been going since 99. In fact, I'm wearing a T-shirt. Well, trust me, it's, it's on the T-shirt. Um, <laughs> there's a course that YWAM has called School of Biblical Studies. It's nine months long, and you go through every word of the Bible five times in nine months. And in fact, before you can come to class to hear a teaching on a different book, you have to sign this paper to say that you read that entire book out loud in one sitting. The only book they divide up is Psalm into three 50-chapter days. But you've got to read the whole thing out loud before you can even come to class. In nine months... You have six days a week, you have your class, and then you have about six to eight hours of, of homework out of class. Six days a week for nine months. You know the Bible pretty good when you finish. There was one student that was, I happened to be teaching the DTS the week of the SBS, School of Biblical Studies, graduation. One of the students uh, was from Oregon. And his parents came down, and I noticed that the, he had been a DTS student in a previous school that I taught. So I, I knew him, had, had good friendship with him. But I knew he was such an intense guy, and he was just driven to do everything perfect. I mean, he had incredible standards for himself and other people. And I met his parents, they came for the graduation. And each student had to make a short five or ten minute presentation in the graduation service. And their son did an, an amazing job. So I met them afterwards. And I went up and I said, man, your son did such a great job. You know what their reaction was? I, 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 I had to walk away because if I had stayed five seconds more... Things that would have come out of my mouth might not have been from the Holy Spirit. She said, well, I guess it was okay. We were hoping for a little more. And suddenly I understood him. There's a saying in Japan, a fish stinks from the head down. So whatever your authority figures are, that's going to shape how you see God. All right, let's say maybe your parents or your authority figures were powerless. You saw them as powerless. I'll give you an example. I was sexually abused when I was about 10. And my parents didn't know about it. And they died never hearing about it. That's okay. God, God's worked on that. But see, Satan never misses an opportunity to capitalize on those events in our lives. That's a thing you hear in what Emmanuel, uh, Rahm Emanuel, who was chief of staff for Obama when he was president, never let a tragedy go to waste. That's, that's the modus operandi of the enemy. He never lets anything go to waste that he can try and twist for his gain in our lives. And... Um, so because my parents didn't stop that from happening, how could they? They didn't know it was happening. The enemy let me believe the lie that my parents were powerless. See how that works? Your concept of God is formed from what your parents were like. Or your Maybe your parents were explosive and overpowering. Maybe you're a... a Child of an alcoholic parent. And you never know who, you know, the, the stereotype is more like the, the dad comes home and you never know which dad he's going to be. Is he going to be good dad or bad dad? Is he going to yell and hurt people and destroy the house or is he going to be, you know, come in and fall asleep? We don't know. When the car's driving up, there's this fear. I don't know which dad is coming in. You know, goes to Christmas past or what? But if your parents were, oaks, if the way they related to you was overpowering and explosive, you're going to think God's like that to some degree. If your parents were distant, maybe you had a parent in the military or they had a job that was far away and they were gone for long stretches of time. 
or they worked where you saw them maybe 30 minutes of the day because they went in before you woke up in the morning and they came back after dinner or something. Who knows? There's a lot of ways that your parents could be distant. But if they were distant and that was the norm for you growing up, the message the enemy will give you is that God is distant. He's far away. It's too far for you to travel to go to him, so don't even try. If your parents seemed deaf to you, like they never heard you. I remember in a theotherapy time years ago where they, they do this role playing and acting out of the people that have hurt you. And I remember this couple was uh, standing in for my mom and dad. And I said, you never listen to me. And the facilitator wisely rephrased it for me and had me say it to them in a different way. And I said, instead of pointing the finger at them, I said, I never felt heard by you. And when I said those words, I broke. Because I realized their brokenness is brokenness begets brokenness. Hurt people, hurt people. Love people, love people. Forgiven people, forgive people. But hurt people, hurt people. They force people in the present to pay the price of people that's not been paid yet, of people who hurt them in the past. And they feel justified in doing that. And they don't, they don't realize how much they're operating out of unhealed crap. Maybe your parents didn't seem to care or they were emotionally absent from you. You told them deep things in your heart and it didn't, wasn't a blip on the screen to them. You'll get the message then. Don't share this stuff with God. He doesn't care. He's too busy trying to stop wars and, you know, fix churches. If your parents were too busy for you, maybe they've got 15 priorities and you were number 16. Everything was more important than you and what you were going through. Satan will tell you from that, God is too busy for you, don't bother him. If your parents were partial to others, uh, like your siblings, for example, the enemy will tell you that God is partial and he loves some more than others. Now, let me give you a little story from my life. When I was growing up, I'm the youngest of four boys. My dad absolutely loved sports to an unbelievable degree. So in our house, it wasn't a question of will you do sports or not. It was a question of which sports will you do. So I tried all kinds of sports and swam in the summer, rode my bicycle, did wrestling, cross country, track. I tried tennis. I was terrible. I tried gymnastics. I was terrible. I did baseball six years. I did basketball growing up. I was terrible. You know, in our family, you do sports. Well, my oldest brother had zero sports ability, zero. So he didn't get affirmed by my dad. And he ended up in a gay lifestyle. That's connected. Second brother had more, had some sports ability. My third brother, best natural athlete I've ever seen in my life. He has trophies from five different sports. Anytime he would pick up a sport, he didn't just do it. He was instantly perfect at it. It's like someone who walked in a room and didn't know a language and all of a sudden they're fluent. That's what he was like. I called him the golden child because it was very obvious that my dad really loved that he, this son of his shared exactly his love of sports. Now, I was okay in sports. I was an average athlete. I wasn't outstanding. I wasn't terrible. I was like somewhere in the middle of the pack. But my golden child brother, he was phenomenal. And so he got lots of affirmation, and it was quite obvious. And the enemy used that to tell me that God loves others more than he loves you. We don't realize how subtle these things are that the enemy capitalizes on. 
and uses to lie to us and distort our concept of God so he can lie about us, so he'll lie to us about others. Da, 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 da. Maybe your parents were manipulative or controlling. They would do stuff for you, but there was always an angle. They wanted to do something for you so you would do something for them. There was not pure motives in their interactions and things they had for you to do. If that was the case, then on some level you're going to think God is manipulative and controlling. Maybe your parents were unfair to you. Let's say you and your brother were wrestling around and your brother went and broke something. And your parents come home and like, who did this? And your brother says, he did. You go, oh, you did that. No, -uh, he did that. Well, there was no hidden camera and the parents don't know. So what do they do? They punish both of you. Is that fair? No. But if that happens enough and you face so much injustice, then you're going to start. It's very easy for Satan to tell you the lie that God is not a God of real justice. He's a God of injustice. He might do some good things for you, but he's not always 100% fair. If your parents were untrustworthy in their promises, now, you're going to think God is that way. Imagine a little boy, let's say six, seven years old, and he comes home from school, you know, he's in first grade, he's all excited, hey, Dad, can we go out in the park and fly the Frisbee and, and bring the dog, you know, before dinner? And Dad says, no, I'm too tired. No, son, I had a rough day at school, at work, you know, just... We'll, we'll do it Saturday. I, I just can't tonight. I'm, I'm just too tired. All right, from Tuesday night till Saturday, what is the only thing that little boy thinks about? Going to the park on Saturday. He tells all his friends of school about this to the point they're sick of hearing about it. Come Saturday morning, he usually sleeps in, but not this Saturday morning. He's up at 7 o'clock. He makes his bed. He takes the trash out. He feeds the dog. He puts his shoes on backwards he's like so excited and he opens dad's door and dad's sound asleep and he jumps on the bed hey dad wake up it's time to go we're gonna go to the park remember you said you said and dad goes oh, no son not today I, I need to rest we'll, we'll go another time just, just never never mind go 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 get away what happened to that little boy's heart If that happens repeatedly, the little boy learns that he can't trust his dad's promises, but he doesn't realize he's transferred that trait onto God so that you don't put both feet down on the promises of God in the word of God because God is not completely trustworthy in your idea. Maybe you share confidences with your parents that you don't want to go anywhere else. And they blab them out, totally disrespecting your boundaries. Satan will tell you God is like that. And so what you do is you put walls between you and God because you can't fully trust him if he comes all the way in to your holy of holies. Because remember, you are the temple of the Holy Spirit now. He lives in a temple not made by human hands. And where he resides, where his glory is, is, is in our holy of holies. That's the deepest part of us. That's where all the sacrifices need to be made. That's where all of the, the healing needs to happen. But the enemy says, whatever you do, do not let God there. Lastly, if your parents were stingy, they only do things for themselves. They never give you what you want, but they're quick to give what they want. If that's your experience, you can think God is stingy. Don't even ask him for good things because he is not going to give it to you. He might to other people, but not you. Don't even ask. I get asked this question every time I teach this, so I'm going to go ahead and tell you the answer to save you asking it. When I go through all this list that we're going to do in the next three weeks, People will say to me, okay, guilty, guilty. I see the orphan spirit. How do you break the orphan spirit? I said, well, I can give you a list. I got a list if you're into lists. 
Yeah, it's good. Good stuff. Truthful stuff from the word. But number one with a bullet. Number one by far. If you want to break the orphan spirit, the quickest way to do it is to be generous. Because you're going in the opposite spirit of what the enemy is telling you. You're becoming like your father. Your father, God loves a cheerful giver. God so loved the world that he gave. God has all the love languages. He's not limited. We're the ones that are limited. Well, I'm high in this, but not in that. He's high in all of them. But especially giving. (laughs) So if you want to break the orphan spirit, you be generous. And that is what will break this orphan spirit off of you. All right, time's getting away, so let me go quickly to um, how do, let's contrast that. We don't need to go as much detail. How do sons and daughters see God? Oops. Sorry, my markers are a little faint. I wrote the word Abba, not the singing group. The Hebrew name of God. I did not fully grasp. I mean, I still not fully grasp. I didn't begin to grasp the the significance of that until I was in Israel one time. I was at the Western Wall, the Wailing Wall. I think I've already told this story, but I'm going to tell it again because there's some that are, I know there's some new that are watching. I'd already prayed at the main wall, and I don't know, 100 yards, 150, I'm not so good on distances, but there's another wall about this high. And on the sides of this wall, it slopes up so that when you're standing behind the second wall, you're maybe this high above the people down below, give or take. Those of you been there, yeah? All right, so a lot of people will watch what's going on down here. It's one of the most iconic places in the world. You know you're not anywhere else but Jerusalem. So I'd already prayed at the wall, and I'm watching, and about, about as far as these guys are, there was a young mother, maybe in her 20s, and she had two little boys. And the young father came up to the wall, and she handed the four-year-old to him, and he put him on the ground, and the four-year-old's grabbing his leg so tightly he's having to walk like this. She hands him the little two-year-old, he puts him in his arms, and the two-year-old is almost strangling him, and they're walking up to the big wall. And there's chairs and tables. You can rearrange it however you want. God did a miracle for me. He silenced all of the other noise, all the other people. And the only thing I heard as they walked up to the wall with these two angelic little voices saying, Abba, Abba, oh, Abba. They went up to the big wall. He got a chair. He sat in the chair right in front of the wall. He had one le- son on one leg, one on the other. He held them close, tussled their hair. He kissed them. He, he's pointing to the wall, and he's teaching them. Their eyes are big as silver dollars, and they're drinking in every word he says, and there's nowhere in the world they would rather be than right there, right then. And when I saw this scene, this movie playing before me, I heard the Holy Spirit say, that's all I want from you. Just that. Everything else is religion. This is why I'm quick to say your greatest calling in life, calling, whose definition do you want? The world's definition of calling or God's? Your greatest calling is to let God love you. And the more, as we say in the South, the more ed up you are with his love for you, then that will influence and and marinate everything about what you do. You will operate out of love the way your father does. So instead of the abuser, sons and daughters see God as the healer. Instead of judgmental, they see him as merciful and forgiving. Instead of powerless, they see him as powerful and mighty. I love to hear a little kid who's got a healthy relationship with their dad. My dad can beat up anybody. That's how we need to live. 
more impressed with our father than with the enemy. Sons and daughters know that he's not explosive or overpowering, but he is gentle, tender. Sons and daughters know he's not far away. He's closer than your breath. Sons and daughters know he's not deaf. They know that his ear is right on your heart. He doesn't want to just hear the words out of your mouth deeper than that. He wants to hear the heart behind the words. Because a man, as a man thinks in his heart, so he's, he is. And out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. So God's listening to your heart behind what you say. Sons and daughters know that he is the ever-present comforter. I love Psalm 46. He's an ever-present help in time of need. They know that he is sympathetic. Hebrews is it's some great, I love Hebrews, one of my favorite books in the Bible. Jesus was tempted in every way like we are. Every way. And we think, well, he didn't have a bad father growing up. No, but it says just before this, he had to be made like his brother, brothers in every way. He had to be made like them so that he could be at a faithful and effective high priest, so he could walk in our moccasins, so that when we talk to him, he understands what he's not unacquainted. Well, I, you know, it's like a couple talking to me about marriage problems. I said, look, I can give you some biblical principles, but... I've never been in the throes of marriage and trying to work out that. I, I am not going to begin to give you advice in an area I have zero experience. You want to talk about single for a long time? Yeah, I can give you some, <laughs> I can give you a book on that. But, <laughs> you know, so we, I can't give out of my thing. But um, sons and daughters know that God can relate, sympathize, and empathize with whatever I'm feeling. Because trust me, he had infinitely times whatever it is we're dealing with. Sons and daughters know that he's not too busy, but that his favorite thing is to be with us. You know, we're the little kid that, in, that uh, comes to his boardroom where he's having a meeting with his top angels. You got Michael and Gabriel and all these guys, and they're strategizing, you know, working out, okay, what do we need to, to do today to hasten the end? And I come in and his secretary is there and says, oh, yes, uh, but, but you have to wait. They're having a meeting right now. He says, no, uh, my, my dad will let me in. I open the door. My dad sees me. He says, the angels, he says, all of you leave. This is the most important meeting I have today right now with my child. Sons and daughters know there's not a schedule to interrupt with God. They know they are the schedule. Sons and daughters know that he loves all creation. All that were created in his image, he loves. I mentioned this, I think, last week or sometime. I've spoken so many times, like, I don't know what I said when. So forgive me if I'm saying something again. Just get over it. Um, from some passages in the Old Testament, I have a hunch that maybe Jesus' favorite disciple or the one he was closest to was not John but it was Judas if you look at some of the Psalms because a lot of the Psalms are messianic correct not only Isaiah and other passages but a lot of the Psalms because David was a man after God's own heart so a lot of the experiences David had were foreshadowing of what Jesus experience was going to be like as son of man so from that, some, from some of that, it's made me think, I wonder if maybe Judas wasn't the one he, was, he loved dearest, and the dearest cut was Judas. Wouldn't that make sense? The one closest to him was the one that betrayed him. Just throwing that out. I'm not saying thus saith the Lord, but I'm just pondering it. Sons and daughters know that God never manipulates and controls, but he loves to set us free. And if the sun sets you free, whoo, free indeed. Free at last, free at last. Thank God Almighty, I'm free at last. 
Sons and daughters know that God is not unfair, but he is just. Whether I understand it or not, whether it agrees with my concept of what justice is, that doesn't matter because his ways are above my ways and his thoughts are beyond tracing out so far above mine. But if you don't start with the rock solid belief, God is just always. If you leave an out for that, that well, maybe God sometimes needs to phone a friend because he's, you know, I could have done it better. Sons and daughters know that he's always just. They know he's faithful to his promises. Whether they have seen them fulfilled yet or not, they know that God never teases. He never dangles something in front of us so that if we reach for it, he goes, ha, now get back to work. No. Sons and daughters know that if he promised it, it's going to happen. I don't know how. I don't know when, but it's going to happen. I was talking to somebody the other day about some things that I think will happen. It, by faith, because nobody knows for sure what's going to happen except God. Um, some things that I think will happen in the, in the coming year or two or whatever. And I, every time I say some of this to people, they'll say, oh, come on, how is that going to happen? And my response is, I don't know, but this is what I do know. In the Bible... Three to five million people had just come out of Egypt from being prisoners, slaves. They were facing the Red Sea, mountains, desert, and they could look back and see the dust in the air from Pharaoh's army uh, chariots galloping on their way to them. There was nowhere for them to go. I said, so let me ask you this question. Out of those three to five million people, Israelites, who knows, you know, different people have different estimates. How many of them do you think nailed it and predicted what God's solution was going to be? You know how many I think? See, God's not in our boxes. And God's solution and God's way of fulfilling his promise to us, it's not yet in our mind and we get offended when we don't have a say-so in how he does everything he does in our life. And why do we do that? Well, what happened when you were growing up? Is this making sense? Hmm. In India, if they want to say yes or no, they do the same thing. Hmm. So if you're struggling to sleep, just, you know, do your head. Uh, almost finished. Sons and daughters know that God guards the intimacy that you have. He's not going to blab to everyone the things you share with him in confidence. Things spoken in the quiet place stay in the quiet place. It's kind of like Vegas, but a lot better. And finally, sons and daughters know that God is insanely generous. I love talking to YWAMers who, uh, you know, they're younger and they've not had, you know, many years of God proving his faithfulness and his provision to them. And I've got more stories of God's faithfulness and provision than I ever had hair. And I'll just start rattling off stories to them to build their faith. You know, needing an airline ticket to buy it by midnight so I could fly out at six in the morning and the money comes at 11.40 p.m., sometimes God does do things at the 11th hour. Get on the phone, I get the ticket, I hang up the phone, it's 11.59, I take a nap, I get up, I pack my bag, and I'm on that flight at 6 in the morning. God has provided way more than I need for 25 years I've been in YWAM, and of course all my life before that. Sons and daughters don't live with a poverty mentality. How can you live with a poverty mentality when you remember that you live in the palace of the king of kings who owns everything? So next week we'll talk about how with the orphan spirit we see or relate to ourselves. And it flows out of how you see or relate to God. I'll probably say that multiple times every week. Hopefully it'll sink in with you. All right, so I've given 
three minutes for questions. <laughs> We're supposed to stop at eight. Sorry, but I went a little long. So give, give me comments, questions. Shoot. Good. And we all are on both sides. It's a process, like John the Baptist says, I must become less and he become more. It's a process of undoing those lies because it took, when they were planted earliest in life, they took deep roots. You don't pull up something that's got deep roots like very easily. Sometimes it takes work. It means digging. So it's a process we're all on of learning to become sons and daughters of Abba. That's why I'm with vision statement. That's why my vision statement is I am called to demonstrate sonship to the nations. And if I'm going to do that, that means I've got to know Abba. That means all the areas where my concept of him is still a little off kilter. I need to give Holy Spirit permission to help me in that transformation. Help me to have my mind renewed to the mind of Christ. Yes. Um, when you first asked us to think, oh, food. <laughs> um, said food. I said foo. <laughs> um, when you first asked us to uh, come up with uh, the descriptive in regards to um, Father, our Father yeah. figure, and God, um, I literally, the very first words that came to my mind were kind and gentle and loving and patient. And then you went through all of the orphan spirit aspects. And I went, oh, yeah, oh, yeah, yeah. And all of those were things that I had truly experienced and felt. Yeah. But before my father passed, um, I was not a believer. Um, but I had been living with him briefly. And... Um, and he asked me to come into the library, and as I did, I was like, oh, what did I do? And he goes, just come in here, honey, and sit down. And I said, okay, Dad, all right, fine. It's a long story short. He said, I need to know, will you forgive me for not being the father you needed, for not having been there and listened and been available as you needed? And he said, I've got every excuse, but I haven't been the father you needed. And I need to know before I die, will you forgive me? It took him, well, I think um, that was in 86. He died in 90. And that literally, I wasn't willing to relinquish my hatred towards God at that time. But it literally snapped in me. And I said, yeah, Dad, you're fine. Don't need to ask me for forgiveness. You're fine. No, nothing's wrong. And I tried to escape, and he wouldn't let me. He goes, honey, please, because he was a believer. And he had completely turned around and recommitted his life prior, just prior to that. And, and so when that happened, it brought such an incredible healing mm -hmm. to that massive breach and it's one of the most amazing things looking in my life that God has done because the, literally my first reaction to you and your questioning was gentle, kind, loving, patient. And I'd forgotten everything else. Yeah. And I had received his forgiveness and I was able to forgive and it was, it was one of the best things. So That's awesome. Um, I, I will say this that, that reminded me of one thing. When I talk about this orphan spirit, the hardest people to recognize any orphan spirit in themselves are people with a religious spirit. Do you know what a religious spirit really is? Anger toward God. And they mask it with religiosity. But deep down, there's a grudge against God. I saw this when I was uh, just down the street eons ago. I, I did a six, 
three, six month, I don't remember, thing at this radio station, WNAH. It's an old time gospel station. That's never been my type of music, but hey, it was work and I was in school. And one after another of these preachers that would come in, you know, on the, online, they would, you know, talk the talk and everything. But their lives were filled with poison. And the way they would interact with people and the scowl on their face and the looking down. I mean, goodness gracious. If that's following the Lord, please can I have plan B. Um, but it is amazing. When we forgive, his asking you for forgiveness was not just for him. He knew because he was a believer that you needed to forgive. He needed to see you set free before he went home. Because if he's a believer, he was already in the process of letting God do that for him. We're, we're over time, so I guess we can cut the tape. I'm happy to stay as long as you want. For, but to all of you back home, thank you for being online wherever you are watching. And uh, again, if you have any questions or comments, please shoot them to us and maybe we can address them next week. Uh, so any other comments, questions? Yes.